Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the previous video we started writing the light culling compute shader and we got halfway there. So today we are going to write the rest of the shader and add it to the list of built-in shaders so that it's compiled and ready for use in the render. I'll start by explaining the intersection functions so that we understand the shader code that I'm going to write next. Consider a plane with normal n and distance d from the origin. We define the space where the plane's normal is pointing towards as the positive half space of the plane. Everything in this space is in front of the plane. The objects here are also said to be outside the plane. In the opposite direction, we have the negative half space, where the objects are inside or behind the plane. In order to determine if a sphere is outside or inside a plane, we first project its center point onto the plane's normal vector. This is a simple dot product that returns a scalar value, which is just the distance of the projected point from the origin. Subtracting the plane's distance d will give us the signed distance of the sphere's center from the plane. If this distance is less than negative r, where r is the sphere's radius, then the sphere is fully inside the plane. Note that we can test if a point is behind the plane using the same equation if we set the sphere's radius to zero. We can write this equation as a function in our HLSL code and use it for intersection testing with thrust on planes. We already defined plane, sphere, and cone data structures, and we can use them in our functions, which we are going to add in commonfunctions.hlsli. The code that we are going to use is already written for us on this website, which we are using as the source for our base implementation. So we can go ahead and copy some code over to our shader file. The first one is a function that determines whether a sphere is inside or behind the plane. We only have to change some notations. As I just explained, we say that a sphere is inside a plane if it's fully in the negative half space of the plane. Then we can use this function to test the sphere against each thrust on plane. I'm going to write this function a bit differently by packing all conditions in one statement that results in a boolean true or false. Also note that we reject lights when they are inside the plane, whereas we accept lights that are at least partially inside the frustum. Therefore I think the naming of these functions is a bit unfortunate, but let's go with these names just to keep our code in line with the source material. So first, if the sphere is fully behind the near plane or fully behind the far plane, we return false. Otherwise, we check if the sphere is fully behind any of the remaining four planes of the frustum. If the sphere is not fully inside any of the six frustum planes, then it's intersecting the frustum and we return true. The next one is cone plane intersection. Let's again consider the same plane, but this time we have a cone that has a tip at position t, height h, and a base radius r. We can also define a unit vector d, which we can use as the direction of the cone. Then we can define another point q on the cone's base, which is farthest away from the plane in the direction of n, if the cone is in front of the plane. When the cone is behind the plane, q would be the closest point to the plane. The cone is inside or behind the plane when both t and q are in its negative half space. We already have the position of point t, so we need to calculate the position of q and use these equations to check if they are both behind the plane. The first step is to acquire a vector that is perpendicular to both plane normal and cone direction vectors. We can get this from the cross product of plane normal with the cone direction. In this presentation, this vector is coming out of the screen towards your eyes. Next, we calculate a second vector that's perpendicular to this cross product and the cone direction, which is again calculated using a cross product. We call the resulting vector m. 
You can determine the direction of a cross product using the right hand rule as shown here. We find Q by starting at cone's tip, walking H units in cone direction D, and R units in the opposite direction of M. Note that we used the minus sign to reverse the direction of M here. Now we can write these equations in our shader code. So we need to check if the tip of the cone and point Q on the cone space are both inside the plane's negative half space. Therefore, we have to write a function to check if a point is inside the plane, which as I mentioned before, is the same as the sphere inside plane function for a sphere whose radius is zero. Then we can write the function that determines if a cone is inside the plane. Here we need to calculate point Q and then check if both points T and Q are inside the plane. Now we can use this function to check against the six Frosson planes. This time we just copy the code from here and I'll move the function so they are in order from simple to more complex in terms of geometry that's being tested. Now that we have our intersection functions ready, we need to define a light type enumeration, which I'll put in a new shader include file. I'll name this file commonconstants.hlsli. This enumeration must be the same as the one we defined in the high level light class. Now we can write the light calling section of the compute shader. First, we need to know which tile we are in so that we can get the frost zone that belongs to this tile. We can do this by calculating a grid index using the group ID and the width of the grid. This is similar to how we calculated the index in grid frost on shader, except now we use group ID instead of dispatch thread ID. Remember in grid frost on shader, each thread represents a tile, whereas in light calling shader, each thread group represents a tile. We can use this index to get the frost on. Next, we need to have the min max values for the frostum, which we can get from the group shared variables. In the last video, we negated the depth values to make comparisons easier, so now we need to negate them again in order to end up with negative z values. Each thread within this thread group can take a light from the lights array and use the intersection functions to determine whether we should keep it or reject it. Note that the number of threads in this group is the same as squaring the tile size. So the next light in the array to be examined by the current thread is at this offset. We constructed grid frostums in view space, so the light positions also need to be in view space for intersection testing. We can do this transformation by multiplying each light's position by the view matrix. For point lights, we can use the position in view space and the lights range to construct the bounding sphere. Then we test if this sphere intersects the frostum. If that's the case, we increment the group shared light count by one using interlocked add function. This function will atomically increment the value of light count and write its previous value into our index variable. And that's where we need to write the light index in group shared light index list. However, we only do so if we still have room in this array. We can repeat this for spotlights with the addition that we also need to transform spotlights direction in view space. Then we can use the view space position, range, view space direction, and the cone radius to construct a bounding cone for the spotlight. This time, we use the intersection function for cones and add the intersecting light in exactly the same way as we did for point lights. This was all for the light calling section. We ended up with a list of light indices and a light count. 
In the next section, we'll reserve some space in the global light index buffer that's large enough to hold all light indices for this tile. Then we write the offset of that allocated space along with the number of lights into the light grid buffer. First, we need to clamp the light count so that it's not larger than the maximum lights per tile. Note that even if the array was full, we still kept incrementing the light count, so it may be larger than the array size. Then we use a single thread in this group to increase the global light count by the number of lights in this tile. This will effectively give us an offset within the global light index buffer, which we can use as the start offset to write the light indices. Next, we update the light grid with this offset and the light count. In the final section, we simply write the light indices into the global index buffer at the start offset we got in the previous section. We can use all threads in the group to write one or more indices per thread. This concludes the light calling compute shader. I probably made a few typos which will get thrown back in our face when we try to compile the shader, so let's try that next. I'll add a new enumeration for our shader and create a new entry in the list of engine shaders. You'd like to define the tile size if we are compiling either the grid frustum shader or the light calling shader. Before running the program, I'd like to make this function to recompile engine shaders if any file was modified in the shaders folder, not just the engine shader files. And the reason is that we'd like to recompile if we change or add any code in our shader include files. Right now, this doesn't happen and it's easy to forget that we need to rebuild the shaders, which can cause quite a bit of confusion. So instead of looking at each engine shader's date, we look at the date of any file that's within the folder. So for each file in shader's source path, we check if it's newer than the compiled shader's file, and if so, we recompile. Okay, bug fixing time. Here is my first typo. If we want to define variables of the same type on the same line, we need to use comma. Here we have got an error where we sampled the depth buffer, but I can't see anything wrong with it. Hmm. Let's skip it for now and move on to the next error. Here we need a period. And I forgot to include the common constants file, that's why it doesn't recognize the light type constants. So now all errors are gone, except the one about the texture 2D sampling, which I don't understand. Let me just use zero here instead and see if it works.
Well, that looks okay to me. It could be a compiler bug. I don't think we have updated DirectX Shader Compiler in quite a while now, so let's try a newer release and see if that helps. We can simply delete this folder and our script will download the latest release as soon as we rebuild the solution. And it worked! So it was a compiler bug after all. Awesome. Now, while we are here, let me also update to the latest Agility SDK. Set the correct version number here and we are ready to go. Great! Now that we successfully compiled the light coming shader, we can try and run it. In the next video, we are going to set up the buffers in the C side and write the code that will dispatch the light calling compute threads. As always, thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!